Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Luba Vangelova. I'm the founder of The Hub, an online community for homeschoolers that offers a range of programs. And I am joined here today uh, by Liz Quain, who has been, well, she can tell you what she's been doing. It's, it's quite interesting, something called world schooling, which may be new to some of you and not so new to some of you, and hopefully we'll uh, cover enough to make this of interest to um, people in both camps. So over to you, Liz, if you could introduce yourself um, and explain what this concept of world schooling is. Sure. Thank you so much, Luba. Um, I know we kind of connected a few years ago, so I'm really glad that um, we're doing this because um, as a world schooling parent, I'm really trying to, um, I guess, uh, promote it, the, the lifestyle and normalize it a little bit. Um, sometimes people think it's only for the rich and famous <laughs> that can stay at these five-star hotels and take their kids and jet set, but it's actually... Um, for everyone, I mean, for as many people as can figure out how to um, at least have a basic uh, affordability. Um, it's not just for rich. Um, so world schooling is similar to homeschooling, but um, you are using the world as your classroom. And my kids and I have 13 and a half year old twin girls. We've been world schooling for um, and traveling most of the time for over six years. And we have visited or lived in 20 different countries. Um, Prior to having kids, I used to travel a lot. You know, I backpacked around the world years ago as a young woman and um, just always took a lot of uh, trips abroad and vacations. So it's a huge passion of mine. And then, um, you know, I used to own a children's business that included a preschool. And when I decided to sell it, because I was really burned out from running a br brick and mortar business, um, I was trying to think about what to do next. And I heard about the concept of being a world schooler with the kids and then for myself to be a digital nomad. So I thought that made a lot of sense. And I thought, okay, let's try it for a year. And we um, traveled around Asia and a little bit of um, Europe that first year and we loved it. So my kids keep voting to, to go. Well, one of them keeps um, going, but one of them is taking a break. We can talk about that later. Um, but basically, you know, the first year I was trying to figure out what to do education wise because my kids had gone to a traditional public school and they they had um, already gone through kindergarten and first grade. Um, previously, they were in my play based preschool. So they were kind of having a hard time with all the rules and having to line up and not being able to go to the bathroom when they needed to, you know, just um, all the rules and regulations and all the pressure. Um, to learn all this academic stuff and have homework at such a young age. So um, uh, I was trying to figure out what to do with, with, with their education while traveling. And I initially, um, you know, we were in Bali and I met um, a homeschool mom who was following the Charlotte Mason method. So, you know, I was trying to learn from her and I was trying to learn from other people. Um, some of the families were unschooling and I thought that was sounded pretty radical. And I thought at first, oh, no way. Um, but a lot of um, world schoolers who initially homeschool or follow a curriculum or follow a method, method a lot of them kind of move over to uh, unschooling or self-directed learning because, you know, the world is strewing to them. It's introducing so many topics to the kids and so many uh, conversations get started. So Eventually, we moved to that direction, but at first, I was really confused about the education method, and I was trying to sit my kids down and let's read Harry Potter, and they're like, but no, we're I want to go outside and check out that giant spider that's in that tree, and I heard some monkeys way over there, you know, let's go try to find them, and you know, they were just wanting to be um, out in nature or, you know, make things and be creative, so I relaxed a little on that, and it was good because I heard about de-schooling. So we spent that first year de-schooling um, because me trying to get them onto the laptop to do Khan Academy math lessons wasn't working so well. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, basically uh, world schooling is using the world as your classroom and, you know, looking at different cultures, languages, um, the different religions and the nature out there in the world. Uh, you know, as you get older, learning about politics and the history of the place and you know, just all the global um, aspects that are out there in the world. And it was really important for me um, to raise my kids to grow up to be global citizens. And I didn't want them to be typical American princesses. And, 
you know, kind of getting sucked into the whole um, consumer um, oriented society. So um, since I had traveled abroad, I saw how it really changed my perspective about the world and life in general. I think I don't sweat the small stuff so much. And, you know, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, other people around the world and other cultures and you know, when people get so upset about something um, here locally or nationally, I've realized like in the big scheme of things, you shouldn't get upset about that. So I think it really helped me um, change my perspective. Uh, I, I learned to become a more patient person, more understanding, more empathetic. So these are things that my kids are picking up. And, um, you know, now, just so you know, you don't have to travel to be considered a world schooler. Um, I think it's the intentional um, act of trying to bring the world to your kids. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whether there's like an international market near your house or festivals or, you know, making friends from other culture and asking them about, you know, their family history and how they came to your country or, um, you know, just there's usually in bigger cities and at least in the U.S., there's a lot of cultural events and obviously lots of different types of food that you can explore. And, you know, there are, you know, Buddhist temples <laughs> in the area, you know, so you can really, um, you don't have to get on a plane or a train um, to go abroad to world school. Of course, that's the ideal way. Um, and But, you know, you don't have to do it. And now some families are full-time world schoolers. Some people are part-time world schoolers. They might just, um, if you're in traditional school, go on school holidays, which is kind of expensive. That's when airfares really go up. But a lot of homeschoolers will travel, um, you know, either domestically or abroad and, um, you know, take advantage of those like shoulder seasons or whatever. Um, so, you know, some people, again, are intermittent um, world schoolers and uh, some people do like a one year gap year a family gap year. So there are many different ways to do it. Now, some people move to another country and I guess they're more like expats, um, but, you know, they're learning about that new country's culture and maybe visiting the surrounding family. So I still consider them world schoolers as well. So um, it is my mission to help promote world schooling because thanks to the beauty of the internet, many of us can work online and, um, you know, especially now since post pandemic, a lot of people are still working from home and I'm just trying to encourage them not just to, you know, get their kids in an RV and drive around the U S which is awesome or whatever country you come from, but go one step further and go explore another country. And, um, I think that you'll find there's a many benefits to world schooling. And, um, again, we, we don't look at this lifestyle as just being perpetual tourists. Um, you know, a lot of times we're doing monthly rentals, furnished rentals, and um, kind of living, I wouldn't say like local so much, Well, although you can, um, but maybe, you know, temporary expats. And um, it's just, it's more available to everyone. And I think a lot of people get stuck on um, this, even if they work remotely that, you know, oh, what am I going to do with my kids? How am I going to educate them? And I did do a video um, on the six top ways to world school kids, six different ways to educate. So we can briefly go um, through those top six ways, but sorry, I'm talking a lot, but that's kind of uh, the beginning of uh, talking about world schooling. Yeah. Um, so just to kind of um, step back, because it's interesting that um, you mentioned that you don't even need to be traveling to be considered a world schooler. So in a way, it sounds like world schooling may be more kind of a mindset rather than a physical thing that people do. And you mentioned about, you know, traveling around the U.S. or whatever country, you know, someone lives in, in an RV, which is probably, you know, uh, a lot of, would be a lot more accessible to people. I mean, whether it's in an RV or just, you know, in a vehicle with a tent or, um, yeah. whatever, but, um, would you consider that world schooling or, um, sure. Yeah. Again, it's, um, you know, it's just out going outside of your hometown. Mm -hmm. You've got your little bubble and just expanding your bubble to, to look at more of the world and your country is part of the world too. 
Um, so yes. I, again, there's the, the, especially the U S is so big. There's so many yeah. different cultures in the U S and so much history and the East coast is different from the West coast and the national mon monuments. And you know, you go to Louisiana and that's very different or versus, you know, new England. Uh, there's a lot of, um, differences in our country yeah. and there's tons to learn. And I guess we, a lot of those people call themselves road schoolers. Mm. And there's also boat schoolers, oh, <laughs> people yeah. who sail around or boat around. So there's many different ways, different uh, modes of transportation to do it. But I have to say that, uh, you know, it's it may be less expensive to world school right now because mm -hmm. of inflation than uh, road schooling in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. Because the, you know, cost of living, yeah. even if you're traveling around, the cost of gas is so high and you can live, um, you can go to a lower cost of living country and possibly live more affordably than are being around with your kids, um, depending on yes. where you're going. Absolutely. Um, so I remember uh, way back um, in my much younger days when I spent a year um, backpacking um, around uh, Australia and Southeast Asia. And uh, I mean, I was fortunate in that um, I got a I happened to do it during a recession and the company I'd been working for was offering buyouts. I took a buyout and I used that money to travel for a year. And I know several other people who have done exactly that, um, you know, during um, downsizing waves. And um, so one thing that um, I remember very um, starkly was the, the range of people who were doing this, um, you know, there were, People who had just regular office jobs and had been saving for a while. There were, you know, engineers, there were plumbers, butchers, um, just like people from people who worked in theater, people. From, it was just like, you know, a construction worker, you know, yeah. a, um, like just people from very different walks of life. And one thing that um, and we can get into some of the practicalities in more detail later, but um, was, yeah, the. Um, it's about uh, purchasing power of whatever currency you happen to have. And you can travel for a very long time, especially if you're doing it during a transitional period where maybe you, you've you left a job um, or whatever, and where you can give up paying rent or a mortgage if you're moving or whatever, and not have that expense. Um, it's really quite amazing how far the money that you would be paying toward rent or mortgage can go in another country with a much lower cost of living. You may find you can live six months off of what you know would have um, you would have been paying for one month in the U.S. Yeah, no, anyway. Absolutely, absolutely, and yeah. Back then, uh, when I was backpacking as a young woman, um, and then I took a year. Also, I got laid off from a dot com job in San Francisco, and I lived in Spain for a year, and and uh, went to a language school, you know, to learn Spanish. So I've done it twice. Um, you know, I met lots of people like you did who, like me, would work and save up money and then, you know, sell the car, put some stuff mm -hmm. in storage and then grab a backpack and go. And um, nowadays, I mean, again, those people still exist, but nowadays many of us can work online. And um, I did put together a presentation right. on 235 income ideas um, to fund worlds going. I mean, anyone, it's for anyone. Um, but um so there's lots of ideas there and what we're doing, uh, preferably what you want to do is take advantage of geographic arbitrage. So whether it's a remote job you have with a company in the US or Europe or Australia or any high income country, and then, you know, spending in pesos or bot or lari or lira, you know, that is the way to go because, um, you know, I mean, think about, you know, I'm living in the suburbs of Seattle where it's five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month for a small family of three to survive here and live okay, middle class, I guess. And I would say a lot of times for the same lifestyle in developing countries, and we pick places that are still nice and safe and they have amenities and good internet and all that, but it's, we, we get it down to less than two, $2,000 a month. And, you know, then I can save the rest. And uh, it just gives you more flexibility. Um, and uh, I think, you know, there's this whole um, financial um, fire movement, you know, people are trying to work when they're young and save up money and retire early. You can do that while traveling the world and world schooling as well. Um, I mean, obviously, kids are expensive. And if you 
find expensive things to do, then you won't reach that goal. But um, there's economical ways to do this. Yeah. And um, so can you um, just uh, explain? So you've touched on this about um, how sometimes you'll stay in one place for a month. I mean, so I imagine, you know, different families have different styles. I would imagine some like to breeze through places and just keep going. And some probably like to hang out somewhere and really soak up the culture um, for a month or several months or maybe a year. Um, and so that there's a real range, um, I would guess, of, of styles of doing this. And um, given that, I mean, do you find yourself when you're traveling, um, hanging, do you find the other world schoolers that happen to be in the same place as you at the same time and connect with each other? Or are, do you find yourself mostly interacting with locals or other expats that are not world schooling? Or what, what does the social life look like? Yeah, we participate in all of the above. And um, I, I guess when we first started traveling, we uh, fast traveled a bit more. I mean, not super um, fast. We went to, I think, 10 countries the first year. And some places we whizzed through, especially expensive countries like Japan. We went to many different places in three weeks. And then other places, we were in um, Chiang Mai, Thailand, which is a popular digital nomad hub for a month. And then we were in Koh Phangan Island in Southern Thailand for a month. And a a lot of those places we met other uh, world schoolers and you know you can post in the Facebook groups or sometimes they have a where in the world are you kind of thread where you can go find people or use the search function so we have met loads of people um, traveling fast traveling or slow traveling um, expats um, some of them are really open to meeting us um, and others I think because we're passing through <laughs> pretty quickly that they, they kind of they already have their you know life set up maybe they put their kids in an international school and they may or may not be interested now there are times when we really try to find community um, I recently did a poll and it's one of the top challenges that current world schoolers have is um, having community um, and there are world school hubs um, that are around some of them are uh, running all year round, others pop up, you know, certain times of the year. So we intentionally try to go to those. And some of them are organized really well with lots of activities and you have to pay a fee and maybe there's childcare for the younger kids and teen, teen activities. Um, and then others are just more informal where there's a bunch of families in a town and the parents are in a WhatsApp group. And, you know, it's kind of like a co-op, like a homeschool co-op where you say, hey, today I'm doing X, Y, Z. Who else wants to join? Or I'm hiring a teacher to do, you know, something. So who wants to chip in and do it? So um, there's many ways to do it. And um, we have done it all of the above. We, My daughter, Gabby, who still loves homeschooling. The other one is uh, trying out a Montessori um, in grandma's town. So we can talk about that later. But she wanted to try something different. But Gabby really loves to travel and world school. And she um, wanted to improve her Spanish. So we have lived in several Spanish speaking countries and she's picked it up and I did put her in a couple different um, schools um, just for Spanish immersion. But she was kind of um, still a little, um, you know, still not uh, um, a little shy about speaking it and, you know, saying full sent sentences. So she decided, OK, for the next several months, um, let's go to a Latin American country and uh, learn Spanish. So we went to Buenos Aires and it's not a big world school hub. It's not a place where a lot of world schoolers go. I mean, some people do go through and pass through town, but um, it's not like a place where a lot of uh, world schoolers are living for long terms. So we went there and just through my network of people in alternative education, um, I, you know, found some homeschoolers, some Argentine homeschoolers. And there was one alternative school in um, Buenos Aires, but we went to visit it and most of the kids were young. And my daughter's 13 and she's allergic to young, loud kids. <laughs> so we luckily found some teens and we went, um, one mom organized uh, a meetup at her apartment once a week with an English teacher. Um, and even though obviously my daughter is fluent in English, she still went uh, once a week. It was a small fee and they they obviously were speaking Spanish too. So it was kind of a interchange. And then um, 
I hired a tutor for my daughter pretty intensively for the first month to get her Spanish up to a certain level. And then I found an online version kind of like of the hub. It was a self-directed um, online teen uh, school program, I guess, for self-directed learners run by university in Argentina. So um, Ga I enrolled Gabby in that. And it was a four, four times a week kind of a thing, um, one or two hours a day. And, you know, the students decided what they wanted to learn. And there was a facilitator there to help them with that. So um, even though she wasn't super, you know, converse, conversant at that time, she could listen and answer questions and speak a little. So that's when we really immersed in the local culture and made friends there. And uh, again, a lot of the moms don't speak English. So I'm having to, <laughs> it hurts my brain to hang out with them and hang out with them for two, three hours and speak Spanish. But um. I use Google Translate a lot when we do long messages. Um, but yeah, so we've done all of the above. And I think it depends on what your goals are and, you know, what if you want a community, if you want a social life, if you're extroverted or introverted. I mean, there's many different ways to world school and find community. Mm -hmm. OK. And one of the things um, I noticed in you put some polls up in your Facebook group. Um, and I noticed that um, I, I thought it was interesting the way um, you asked uh, people who were considering world schooling to rank their top concerns or to um, check off their top concerns and then people who are already homeschooling to um, check off their main concerns. And they were not the same. It was interesting, like uh, how many people who um, were thinking about world schooling but had never done it uh, checked off loneliness as a big concern. And all very few people who were actually already world schooling check that as a concern. Um, that was one thing I noticed. But <laughs> Yeah, I, I probably should have uh, combined finding community with loneliness because they're kind of the same thing, I guess, um, because finding community was... Um, you know, the yeah. already world schoolers, number one or number two, I think it was number one issue. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so they're kind of, I, I think when you're living in a traditional life of, what do they call it, bricks and sticks life or something, and you know, your kids are either in school or you're homeschooling them and you have already your community and you have your friends that you've known for decades, maybe. I mean, maybe you've gone to high school there yourself, grew up there, or you're in a new town, but you have community and it's scary it's there's a lot of fear um mm -hmm. of people to leave uh, that comfortable life and that social circle that you already have to go out there in the world and know no one and except for your family um so i think that is a big uh fear but as i you know mentioned before and yes current world schoolers also have that challenge of finding community. Um, and I really wish there were more world school hubs popping up. They are not easy to run. And that's why I, whenever I talk about it, I encourage um, basically we customers to be kind to these world school hubs because it's a lot of work and a lot of mm -hmm. them are not doing it for, for big profit. And mm -hmm. there's, you know, just whenever you have a community, I mean, think about a homeschool community, there's a little drama there and you're sometimes uh, arranging accommodation and transportation and, and activities. And there's so many logistics to, um, you know, go through. So some, some families don't see it as a cooperative because they're like paying money, but then you have to realize this is not the four seasons and you can't, you have your expectations have to kind of be more realistic. So, um, I'm really hoping that more will uh, pop up. Um, I, my daughters and I hosted a teen pop up um, in Turkey um, this past spring for a month, and it was really fun. But you know, again, I learned that it was really you know a lot of work, and I hired a, a Turkish woman to help me facilitate it. Um, so yeah, if you could just explain like these um, in person hubs or pop ups. I mean, I guess some are pop ups and some are more um, long long lasting, longer term. Can you just give um, a concrete idea of what happens at these places? Sure. Um, everyone is different. It depends on the organizer and I guess the families that are coming. Um, we have visited a handful and I'm first I'll talk about the organized ones versus the kind of, you know, self-organizing co-op ones. Um, so there was one in Mexico called Anahata, which is on break right now. Um, but uh, they had a, they rented a resort um, with a swimming pool. And sometimes they move locations, um, but they're in the Cancun area now. And uh, so families live there. So it's a co-living situation. Oh. 
And, it, you know, they usually have like a big hotel room with two double beds. And I guess you could, if you have a big family, you can rent a couple of them. And then there's, you know, a kitchen and a dining area and maybe a swimming pool. And so um, you live there. Um, they try to get good internet for the parents. Um, maybe the dining area turns into co-working space. There's usually yoga and meditation for the parents. And um, then for the kids, um, there's, you know, activities planned. We're going to one in Bansko, Bulgaria this winter for the second year in a row. And this one we really loved um, because the organizer, Emmy, who's Dutch and she's been world schooling for years, she and her 15 year old daughter have put together this hub and it's pretty organized. She, um, this year, there's an apartment complex, um, you know, maybe 20 minutes from the ski lifts. Um, it's a little further away this year than last year, but she has transport. So we have taken over two, we're taking over two out of the five buildings in the complex. And there's a co-working space. There's, I think, an indoor swimming pool. Um, and then she, obviously, we rent rooms from her. She organizes it all. Most of them, unfortunately, are studios and one bedrooms because the way the ski resort is set up for usually for like, you know, week long holiday makers. Um, so big families typically will rent multiple rooms on the same floor. Um, so she will have activities for uh, kids and then another separate uh, stuff going on for teens. And then for little kids, she does have childcare available. You know, for, that's all. there's fees for this. And then there's stuff for the parents to do. We have parents dinner out. We have hot springs. And then uh, three times a week, she has a, a, you know, a little minivan come and take us to the ski gondola to go skiing together as a group. So there's lots of activities going on and we pay her a fee for the accommodation um, and the activities. And um, I really love it because uh, I've been to other world school hubs um, that were not organized like this. And the teens get together once a week at a cafe and then everything else is kind of a la carte, you know, and my girls felt like there wasn't enough going on. They wanted to interact with my kids yeah. every day. And, you know, uh, they, they do do some online learning as well. So they try to, we try to schedule things so it works. Um, but um, we really like it when it's organized and, and I don't think we'd want to do it year round. Um, but um, for three months is awesome. And some people go for just a month. I think it's like a month to month option. Um, so yeah, that's how it goes. And then um, I think oh, one thing I forgot to mention about slow traveling versus uh, fast traveling is um, you need to uh, be, be uh, realize that certain countries have short visas, like mm -hmm. a tourist visa, you can only stay for a month or maybe three months. Mm -hmm. You know, in Europe, you have the Schengen zone that you have to go mm -hmm. in and out of three months in, three months yeah. out. Other countries will give you six months um, or, you know, the Republic of Georgia, we went to gives you uh, Americans and a lot of other nationalities a year. So does mm -hmm. Albania. Um, but if you want to stay longer term, you need to get a residence visa or, or a temporary residence visa and know that a lot of countries, if you're there more than six months, you have to pay income tax in that country, even on your worldwide income. Mm. So it's something that I try to avoid um, just because, you know, I don't consider myself yeah. a full time resident. And then I'm still filing my U.S. taxes once a year. And there are tax benefits of being out of the U.S. 11 months of the year. There's a big tax break. So this nomadic lifestyle is fine financially, you could save a lot of money on taxes. Interesting. Um, I didn't know that. Um, so um, can you talk a little bit about whether this, in your experience, um, seems better suited for certain ages of children? Um, is there an age at which um, the interest level of the children starts to fall off in doing this kind of lifestyle and maybe they crave something more um like uh stable i guess for lack of a better word um or is it just really individual personality based less so than more so than age dependent yeah i think it's both um again my family is experiencing this as well um but as far as age let's start at the beginning i mean i have world school friends who have given birth to their children while they're traveling. I mean, of course, they're not just whizzing through. They're staying in a place and they choose a place where it's good to give birth. And sometimes their children can get a second passport this way if they, <laughs> if that country gives citizenship on being born there, like the U.S. 
most does. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think traveling as a, with a baby, uh, or, you know, small kids is challenging because you have to bring so much stuff. Now you can buy diapers all over the world. You can buy, you know, all those things, but, you know, bringing a car seat, bringing, um, a stroller, all that stuff. I mean, preferably a baby carrier is good. Um, but people with young kids do do it. I do think the challenging time is when they're toddlers and when they're, if you have a runner, like one of my girls was always, I would lose her at the mall or target or whatever. And I even try those little leashes. I know it's mean, but I have twins. So um, yeah, that didn't work because they would just twist around my legs and that was a disaster. So I was really concerned about uh, my daughter running off and we started traveling when my twins were seven and a half. And luckily um, the, the runner kind of stayed close. Um, but uh, that's a challenging time because you need to make sure wherever you're staying, it's uh, baby proofed. Um, you know, Airbnb sometimes are baby proofed. Um, sometimes uh, I think the most dangerous thing is to rent a place with a swimming pool. And if you're too busy to be with your toddler all the time, uh, you know, they could fall in. So now I know in Bali, if you rent a house there, you can, there's a company that comes with the gate that goes around the pool. So you can, you can pay for that. Um, and then, you know, I think the school age years are great. Um, kids are, you know, more uh, pretty flexible with that. And then once the kids hit puberty, some of them want um, to be um, with, you know, uh, other kids for a longer period of time. Now we have met lots of world schoolers when we travel, because I've always made it a point of at least part of the year being around community of other kids. And some of these families we have seen multiple times, you know, in multiple countries, um, three, four countries. So we have our community, even though we're not with them all the time. A lot of times we say, Hey, are you going to this place? We try to coordinate and let, let's meet up again in this country. Um, but one of my daughters, you know, she has a ADHD and anxiety. So she was getting, um, on top of all of the traveling, she really wanted to uh, stop. She didn't like packing. She didn't like waking up early to go to the airport, you know, all the travel hassles um, that, you know, I, I am so used to, she got tired of it. And uh, one of the reasons why I did the teen hub was for her to have that social life, but she really craved a uh, longer term uh, friendship. So uh, luckily my mother has, you know, she's been helping me since my girls were born. Um, and she you know, has a big enough house. Uh, we're staying with her right now. And um, so my daughter, you know, wanted to spend the summer with her. And then when Gabby and I went to Argentina, Aubrey asked, hey, mom, can I try school? And the school near my mom's house was terrible because my mom did not buy a house in a good school district because, you know, she's retired. But I was able to find out I could transfer her. And I found a, a Montessori that was still a public school that had a middle school. So that's where she's going. And grandma just has to drive her. So um, now, again, other families stop traveling when their kids become teens. I would find... I would say that the teenage years are the biggest challenge um, because kids, some kids want to be in one place. Now, my other daughter, though, doesn't care about that. She's a bit of an introvert and she has her friends she's made. She keeps in touch with them online when we're not with them. And, you know, again, this Bonsco thing, there's a whole load, like because one of the co-hosts is a 15 year old girl. So she really made an effort to uh, get teens. They also do a pop up in the Netherlands where they're from, I think, um, in November every year. So um, she they have really made a great effort to have teens. Um, we do find a lot of these uh, world school hubs have younger kids. Um, so sometimes we show up or, you know, there's mostly younger kids. So we intentionally, just because my kids want to be with kids of their same age, try to find teens. That's the biggest challenge. And other kids um, are totally fine with it. Like I said, I even said to Gabby, hey, maybe we should settle down somewhere and get residency, maybe in Portugal or another country and or Spain. OK, I have to pay taxes. But and she just says, no, I don't want to stop. I don't want to settle down. I, and I even we just had a conversation where I said, let's go back to Spain in the spring. We were there last, you know, a year and a half ago, and maybe we can find an alternative school. And if you like it, maybe we can come back every spring or spring and fall. Cause I'm thinking she wants this continuity. And she said, 
No, we've already been to Spain. I wanted, there's other countries I want to go to. Mm. So I think it really depends on mm -hmm. the child and whether or not um, they want to socialize. Now, my one that's going to the Montessori, of course, now she's complaining about it. She's like, mom, you're right. They're making me do a lot of busy work. And, it, you know, just all the stresses of going to a school, even though it's a Montessori, it's still a school and they still have, you know, grades and all that stuff. So who knows? She may uh, want to travel with us in the future. We kind of agreed to have her try it for one school year and uh, we're doing a twin experiment. Um, so this topic that you're asking me about is my, our, my family is living it. Mm -hmm. And one of them wants to stop for a bit and the other one wants to keep going. Yeah. And I guess that also points out to one thing, um, if people are considering it, that it you don't have to make a firm binding commitment. Like if you try it and it's not working, you can pivot and come yeah. right back. <laughs> yeah, right? just like everything so, in life. Yeah. We don't have to do one thing. And again, I, I believe in self-directed learning and I try to give my kids a choice. Luckily, my mom is able to host my daughter and she's happy because she doesn't like living alone and she's lonely. So she likes having my daughter around mm -hmm. and, you know, we have this as a home base now. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, some years you want to do one thing, maybe put your kids in a school while you're traveling. Other times you want to unschool and, or visit world school hubs. Um, yeah, there's different ways. I mean, the top six ways I, I've talked about in an earlier video is, you know, homeschool them yourself. Uh, put them in an online school that tends to be the next step, whether it's um, synchronous or asynchronous, because uh, there's both options and there's traditional online schools and more alternative. And then enrolling them in a, a school, a local school in the country you're at, that is great for language acquisition. I think it's especially good for young kids. But then again, it's, you know, waking up early, getting them er there early, all the school stuff that happens. Um, if you can find an alternative school and they have have Montessori's and Agile Learning Centers and all that around the world, you have to dig around. And then, um, you know, World School Hubs, and then online tutors or, or online or in-person tutors um, or nannies, you know, I, when your kids are younger, just for language acquisition. And then finally, unschooling, which I think is a really good uh, combination with World Schooling. And some of them do a combination of all these. And just for in case there's some people who are not familiar with the term unschooling, and I know that different people define it in different ways. How do you define unschooling? Sure. I don't, I actually prefer, don't, I don't like that term unschooling. I just think it's yeah. a little bit odd. So I prefer self-directed learning um, or child-led learning. Um, some people call it life learning. <laughs> um, there's many ways to uh, describe this. Um, it's, it's basically letting the child, having the child choose what they want to learn. And your job as a parent is not to be the teacher, but the facilitator. And when your kids are young, uh, they may not be able to verbally tell you what they are interested in learning. So you really need to spend a lot of time watching them, being with them. Um, you know, you can't neglect them. And this is the thing, like think some kids who grew up unschooling will say, you know, I really liked unschooling, but I really wish my parents would be more involved and in helping me learn things and would prepare me because now I decided I want to go to college and I didn't really do those things. So I think, um, you know, always being in communication with your child and not being their teacher, but their facilitator, their coach, their um, cheerleader, and still being involved. And we can strew things, um, you know, like strewing seeds to chicken. We can introduce um, topics to the kids, but not force it um, on them. And like I said, the world is great at strewing ideas and concepts and, and all that to the kids. But you as a parent can do that. And I think just helping them be exposed to new things. Um, I know that some unschoolers live in a small town and they don't get exposed to a lot. Um, they don't travel much. Um, I don't know, maybe their parents are anti-online stuff, so they don't get exposed to different ways to live or different concepts. Um, and that's fine, but I just think it's, um, you know, the world is big and you might as well expose them to some of it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think just the kids would uh, figure out what they are interested in, and then you can either hire a teacher or teach it 
um, yourself or find a YouTube video or find an online app for them to start learning how to code because they're interested in that. I mean, whatever they're interested in. And once they're older, they, they'll they pretty much take over uh, if they have good skills to find what they need. Um, some of them will do, you know, internships and apprenticeships to really learn how to do something. And typically a lot of unschoolers, um, they you know, obviously learn what they're passionate about and they dive deep much deeper than when you're in school or even homeschooling. Cause I feel like homeschooling is replicating school, but you know, at home and you're trying to like cover these things that you think that the kids should learn or the school district has said that they should learn. And, you know, there's so many obscure things out there that kids get interested in. And I think that's wonderful for us to learn about our passions and what we're, we're good at um, and want to keep doing so. All right. And, um, so, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought I was going to ask. Um, oh, so, um, I know that, you know, some families who have traveled for a while in an RV or on a boat, let's say, um, they're in close quarters with each other for a lengthy period of time and it starts to get too much. Um, do you find that while world schooling, you're kind of on top of each other more so than you would be if you were just, you know, homeschooling in one place? Yeah, sometimes. But like I said, uh, the RV situation is one of them. I, I really would love to camper van someday around Europe. And I actually rented a camper van in Spain for five days and then Portugal for a couple of weeks. And uh, it was great at first, uh, but then the one in Portugal that we had electrical problems. So we had to return it early. Um, and I, I, you know, it was stressful, like going up a hill w with a manual and my kids complained because it, it, it wasn't enough room, you know, and they just felt like we were, even though there was a uh, sleeping space for the three of us, they just felt like it was we were too much going on. So um, I think I have to wait until my kids have flown the coop, you know, to do this myself. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, again, you can rent a large house, uh, you know, air, they have Airbnbs and Verbos and booking.com, all those things that you can rent a big place. You don't have to stay in a hotel. Um, so that helps. And then, you know, if you go to a world school hub, uh, if you're, you know, they have activities there, um, you can drop your kids off there. And, you know, sometimes parents will go to a co-working co space or just work in their apartment or house. Um, they have, you can get a nanny. I mean, that's, we've, I've, I've hired nannies in Mexico and in Colombia. And um, I had my kids sign up for uh, karate, gymnastics, and cooking class when we were in Medellin, Colombia. So either I or the nanny would take them there. So there's things where, the kids can be, um, you know, with other adult facilitators or teachers. Um, obviously, you can put them in a school. Um, so there are, you know, you can kind of live a regular life with your kids, like a homeschooling life, but you're maybe doing it only for three months and then changing locations. And what about play dates? Um, oh, yeah. And, yeah. Okay. Totally. Yeah. We do lots of play dates. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I, even if there's not a organized world school hub, I make a big, uh, effort into meeting other families again, either other, um, homeschoolers, you know, local homeschoolers. Um, cause typically the, you know, schooled kids are in school mm -hmm. when we want to meet up for lunch or during the daytime, um, or other, you know, expat homeschoolers or locals or other world schoolers. So we schedule a lot and sometimes, you know, we take turns um, hosting a play, play date and the mom or dad doesn't need to be there like if we know them well enough. And that gives you time away from your kids to uh, get work done or run mm -hmm. errands. Yeah. All right. And any other kind of uh, big challenges that keep coming up that we haven't touched on yet that you think are good to point out just so people can mm -hmm. go into this with um, kind of the proper expectations and um, uh, challenges and what ways you found to overcome them. Yeah. Um, again, one of the top issues for pe uh, people who haven't started, started the lifestyle yet is how to fund the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, so this is why I, I put together a list. I was thinking about becoming kind of a digital nomad career coach um, 
for families that wanted a world school, but um, I just, it's a very big overwhelming uh, issue. And uh, again, right now, you know, I am launching a program to help people start world schooling and focus, focusing mostly on the travel tips and the education tips, um, because I figure there's plenty of people who have remote work um, or online income uh, to be able to do the lifestyle. So I'm starting there. I may help with that uh, income issue later, but I have a giant list of 235 ideas. So, um, and I also have an online business coach I can refer people to. She's wonderful if you want to do an online business. So let, let me know if you want her contact info. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the top issues is the funding. Now, some people will sell their house and, you know, right now, or I guess last year, it was a great time to sell your house. And then they'll travel off the proceeds of that. And then while they're traveling, they're trying to figure out their online income. Um, some people will figure out their online income, be, you know, a year or two before they start traveling. So that's kind of the more responsible thing to do. But um, so that is a big issue. And I think um, another issue is not just the kids not being uh, on board with this lifestyle. Like I said, my, my daughter wanted to stop, but as uh, your spouse, your partner, mm -hmm you know, may not want this lifestyle. I mean, they may have, you know, you might, you might be a total wanderlust wanting to travel and raise global citizens. And that's like a huge benefit for my kids. But, um, you, your, your spouse may be like totally happy living a stationary life, totally happy with, you know, whether they are at home all the time or doing the rat race or climbing the corporate ladder. I mean, mm -hmm. that person might be thinking differently than you. So that is a challenge. Now I have, I've met um, moms usually that travel, they're homeschool moms a lot of times or, or not, they'll pull their kids out and they will travel with their kids while their husband is at home, but the husband comes and visits them, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of times and they keep in touch with video chats and they're happily married, but, you know, I guess they've just said, listen, the kids are young once and they, you know, I really want to do this with them. I think it could be good for them. You know, are you okay with us? leaving the country and you stay and man the ship or whatever. Um, now, again, if you do that, you got to make sure to have a notar notarized document from your spouse saying it's okay for you to leave the country because there's like anti-kidnapping laws around. Yeah, the world. I mean, yeah, there's all sorts of practicalities for all these things. Um, and any other things that come up um, regularly that you have you know, that you find yourself coaching people on? Yeah, there's a million questions that people have. And this is a thing because it's, you know, I mean, think about your mom groups and all the questions that people get. It's, it's that plus you're out yeah. there in the world. Yeah. Um, so there's so many questions. And again, this is why I'm putting together a 12 week program. And I'm focusing again on the getting ready, what to do with your house and your stuff and, you know, all that and the mindset and getting over the fear. And then the, all the logistical, practical things yeah. like, don't forget this, don't forget that. Cause a lot of people kind of wing it. And which is fine, but I think um, I just see people, newbies make some mistakes, you know, and oh my gosh, we lost all our luggage or, you know, whatever. We didn't know that this visa situation happened mm -hmm. and here we are stuck. There's just some uh, newbie mistakes. And so I am trying to take all the overwhelm, all the decision making and try to have it in a step-by-step -step fashion. And then uh, half of the program is like the different ways to, to educate their kids. Um, so I, I think there's so many questions and you can go into the Facebook groups for world schoolers and ask them or search for it and find it you can diy i mean there's blogs out there there's uh, youtube videos um but i'm trying to take like all this information and try to get the major stuff um put together in a step-by-step -step fashion in over 12 weeks and it's it's live i will be uh explaining this live and we'll have q a's and all that so um it's there's so many questions um there's so many you know for one family it might be this and for another mm. family oh, that's fine but it might be a different thing so mm -hmm. yeah. um yeah i i will be soon uh posting like all the topics i plan to go over in my program um and let me know if i'm forgetting anything cuz uh again i can i can probably talk forever about this topic but you know there's we all have so much only so much time in the day to talk yeah. or listen yeah and um i just want to throw out there because i know um, one couple I met, they, they didn't have kids, but they actually traveled the world for, I think a year 
doing house sitting and mm -hmm. pet sitting, and they did not even pay for accommodations. Yeah. And in some instances, they also did some kind of barter thing um, where, you know, they would get lodging somewhere, but help out in someone's, you know, cafe or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, in yeah, a way it's, that uh, was... called work away. Work away is work the website okay. for that. Yeah. All right. Um, and there's another one called Woofing W O O F. -I oh, yeah, Willing Workers on Organic Farms. Yeah, so if I you're into that. permaculture, or yeah. organic farms, that's kind of fun. Yeah. yeah, I keep bringing this up to my kids like, we should go spend time yeah. on a farm, and, and they're like, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yes, there's all sorts of ideas, and so, uh, just to wrap up, um how, uh, if they want more information, how can uh, people who have been listening to this find you? Where can they find you? And Sure. Um, I am posting a lot on Facebook um, and it's not publicly all the time on my profile, but you can send me a friend request, L-I-Z-Z-Q-U-A-I-N. Um, if you don't have anything on your profile that shows you have kids, you're a normal or whatever, potential world schooling parent, send me a, a message because I get weird friend requests. I also have a Facebook group. Um, it's a long one. The business name is called Trailblazing Families, and I have a Facebook page, but it's not very active. It's more the group World Schooling, Traveling, Digital Nomad, Trailblazing Families. Um, so just search for Trailblazing Families also on Instagram. I'm not that active on Instagram. I'm trying to be better about it, but I'm posting a lot of content on my personal Facebook profile and in my group. And um, I'm going to be interviewing a lot of other world schooling um, families starting in January when I start my program. I'm posting those in the free group. And I'm also going to be interviewing a lot of world school service providers. So uh, other education, I'd love to talk to you, you know, other education providers or um, travel insurance, you know, or world school mm -hmm. hub leaders and just people who have something to offer a product or service to world schoolers. So those will be in my free, uh, my free group, uh, the, the, the world schooling uh, trail blazing families. And then I'll repost them on my YouTube channel, um, which again, is fairly new. So try to follow me there and yeah, just feel friend to uh, feel free to send me a friend request L I Z Z Q U A I N. All right. And I will also list that information in the blurb um, when I post this video. So thank, thank you, Liz. Um, it's been very educational and hopefully um, the people uh, watching slash listening to this have learned uh, at least something useful and interesting. And um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Luba, for this op opportunity. I really want to encourage more families to start traveling the world and raising global citizens. And there's so many benefits. We haven't even gone through all the benefits yeah. of having uh, the kids, you know, experience um, and have more adventure in their life. Um, and I, just reach out to me. I, I really want to help people live this lifestyle. And uh, thank you so much for letting me spread the word. All right. Thank you. Bye.